You guys remember these? When Aperture came out with the Mini 20 series of lights a couple years ago, I immediately picked up a set and they found their way into my everyday lighting kit. But at the same time, I was also flooding Aperture's inbox with suggestions for how to make these lights better. Please give me a Mini 20 Mark II. And Aperture said, no, but you can have this instead. So Aperture punched the gas and took us from 20 to 60 in 2.1 seconds. Actually, it took more like a couple of years, but you know what I'm trying to say. And now we have two new lights in the LightStorm lineup, the 60D and the 60X. Two new 60 watt fixtures with daylight or bicolor options, a front lens with an adjustable beam angle, and plenty of other great features that we're going to take a look at today. But as always, before we begin, I do want to put the disclaimer out there that Aperture did send me this light to review, but they're not sponsoring the video. And as always, I can say whatever I want. Why do we park on driveways and drive on parkways? Actually, I know the answer to that one, but think about it. Now, the light I have here today is the 60X, which is the bicolor model. Now, why would I opt for the bicolor model when traditionally daylight only models have more output? Well, it comes down to the type of shooting that I do. 90% of my professional work is usually shooting interviews on location. Now, when I go to those locations, I don't know exactly what the ambient environment and lighting is going to be like. So having the versatility and flexibility of bicolor lighting allows me to match any lighting scenario quickly and easily. That's why the Aperture 300X has actually become my go-to light for a key light on these interviews. And its new best friend is definitely gonna be the 60X, which I've been using quite constantly as a hair light or rim light in my interview setups. Now, which model you choose is gonna depend on how you like to work and also what type of shooting environments you find yourself in. If you prefer max output, maybe go for the daylight model. If you prefer versatility, go for the X. So like I said, I've been using the 60X for about a month or so now in concert with my 300X for shooting interviews. Now, recently on a shoot, we brought the wrong control box for the 300X and it was out. We couldn't use it. So all of a sudden the 60X had to step up into the spotlight and become our key light. And even pushing through a Light Dome 2 modifier, it gave us enough output for us to get the shot that we needed. I'll talk more about attaching those traditional Bowen style modifiers to this light a little bit later in the video. So let's take a look at the details of the fixture itself. The 60X is definitely larger than the old Mini 20s and there have been a lot of improvements. It's definitely at home alongside the other lights in the LightStorm COB lineup, sort of similar in size to a 120D Mark II. There's a COB chip, but this one is covered by a lens that can be adjusted forward and back to spot and flood the light from 14 to 45 degrees. That lens control, along with the rest of the lighting controls, are all located on the back of the fixture itself. There's no separate control box like the other LightStorm lights. On my 60X model, I have two control knobs that rotate and click to allow me to make brightness and color temperature changes, as well as access the menu system for all of the effects and dimming curves that you have access to. And don't worry, you can still easily control these fixtures even if you have them mounted somewhere well out of reach using the Citus Link app. Now, the app won't allow you to control the spot or flood mechanism because it's a mechanical adjustment, but you do have full control over brightness, color temperature, and the effects. There's also a permanently attached power connector with a nice little locking connector at the end. The variety of powering options for this light makes me very happy. The fact that everything you need for all those powering options is included in the kit makes me very, very happy. Of course, the light can be powered using an AC wall brick, but it can also be run off of NPF batteries or V-mount via a DTAP cable. Now, you can run the light using just a single NPF battery, but it won't give you full 100% output. So if you're using two fully charged NPF 970 style batteries, the built-in readout shows that they should last you about an hour and 35 minutes. And in a brilliant move, 
Aperture has affixed a little V-mount locking connector on the side of the yoke here, as well as corresponding connectors on both the AC power brick and the MPF battery plate, allowing you to take any of those powering options and quickly clip them right to the fixture itself, keeping everything compact and tidy. Or of course, you can just connect a straight V-mount battery to it and connect it via the DTAP cable. So what about attaching modifiers to this light? Now, it doesn't have the traditional Bowens mount that we've seen on the other COB lights. Instead, what it has is these three clips and a fourth clip up at the top that rotates. What this allows you to do is drop in the included barn doors modifier, simply rotate that clip into place, and now your barn doors are affixed to the front of the light. But earlier I showed you guys that I had used this light with the Light Dome Mark II, which has a Bowens mount. So how did I do that? So also in the kit, you're gonna get one of these. And this is an adapter to that traditional Bowens mount. Again, it goes right here up on the front, clip it in place, and now you're able to use any of those Bowens mount accessories right here on the 60X or 60D. Now, you're not gonna wanna attach something like the Fresnel 2X attachment or the Aperture Spotlight mount to this because it already has a lens that is focusing the light. However, Aperture is coming out soon with something called the Spotlight Mini Zoom, which is a spotlight attachment made specifically for the 60D and 60X. So I know you've probably been yelling at your screen at this point, get to the measurements already. Or maybe you were smart and just selected the chapters down below and skipped directly to this section. Either way, let's take a look. So remember, in this video, I'm testing the 60X, which is the bicolor model. So we're expecting a little bit less maximum output as compared to the 60D, the daylight model. But instead, what I really wanted to explore was the quality of the light and the accuracy of the color temperatures throughout its range, both at full spot and at full flood. And this light has a bicolor range from 2700 up to 6500 Kelvin. So I set the light up and measured it from three meters away at 100% power at 2700, 3200, 4000, 5000, 5500, and 6500 Kelvin. So I took a lot of measurements. So the easiest way to show the results is with this table. When we look at the measured color temperatures, we can see that the 60X is a little bit off. It's most accurate at the tungsten end of its range, but begins to drift by several hundred Kelvin as we move to daylight temperatures. Now this isn't a huge deal, but it's just something to be aware of if you're gonna be matching it against other lights. The readout on the back, you're not getting exactly the color temperature output that you're expecting. Output measurements using both spot and flood showed an increase in power towards the daylight temperatures. Although the difference between 3200 and 5500, the more common color temperatures, is only about 400 lux in spot and only 30 lux in flood. So they're actually pretty close. So when it came to measuring the quality of the light, I wanted to use as many measurement standards as I could on this one. So I used CRI, TLCI, TM30, and SSI. TLCI is a measurement based on how a camera sensor observes colors, and all the scores here are really quite good. CRI and R9 are measurements based on how the human eye observes colors, with R9 being a common value of interest in that red spectrum. While the R9 scores are nothing spectacular until we reach about 5,000 to 5,500 Kelvin, the overall CRI scores are respectable all the way throughout the range. TM30 is a measurement that's also based on how the human eye observes colors, and it measures color fidelity, or RF, and color gamut, RG. All of these values were fairly consistent and yielded respectable numbers again. So SSI, or Spectral Similarity Index, is a measurement index that's becoming more popular these days, so I wanted to include it. What SSI does is it compares the readings from a particular light fixture that you're measuring and compares it to a standard benchmark that has been preset for lights of that particular color temperature. So what it does is it tells us how accurately a light will match those preset standards by comparing its output to a universal benchmark. My CV600 spectrometer is programmed with the standards for 3200, 5000, 5500, and 6500 Kelvin. 
So without standards for 2700 and 4000 Kelvin, I wasn't able to measure and compare those. And unsurprisingly, when we take a look at these numbers, they're all very respectable, coming in mostly in the 70s. And when we look at 3200 Kelvin, we're actually scoring in the mid 80s, meaning that this light would actually closely match an actual tungsten filament. And finally, I measured the green or magenta shift. Now, I only measured these at the flood setting because I really didn't expect much of a difference between spot and flood. Sue me. Now, these readings indicate what type of filtering would be needed to correct the light output. So a magenta reading means the light skews a bit green and vice versa. All these measurements showed a negligible color shift requiring even less than a 1 8 plus or minus green to correct except for 2700 Kelvin, which suddenly skews incredibly green. This would account for those poor R9 scores at 2700 Kelvin. But 2700 Kelvin is not a color temperature you're usually going to be lighting human skin with for a natural look. Now I know, that was a lot of information coming at you really quick. So don't worry if you missed anything or a little bit confused. I have made that chart and all of my actual measurements available in a downloadable PDF in the description down below. And I've also added some links to some articles that'll help further explain TM30 and SSI. Even I had to do a little bit of homework to make sure that I fully understood what they mean and how they work. And man, I really hope I got it right because otherwise the internet's gonna kill me. But finally, if we learned anything from the recent release of the Aperture Amaran 200D, it's that you guys hate fan noise. So, what is the fan noise like on the 60X? I actually find it comparable to the noise that comes from my 120D Mark II fixture when that begins to heat up after long-term use. And it is definitely way, way better than the noise that these guys used to make, which was really a big problem. So all in all, these are some very versatile new lights. Like I said, I've been using it as a hair or rim light in concert with my 300X for interview shoots, but with all the different modifiers, you can turn this into a soft light. You can use it as a hard light. You'll be able to use it as a spotlight. It definitely, in my opinion, has the power to hold its own as a key light, which means you could have a very compact but still capable lighting setup for when you're on the go. Both the 60X and the 60D are available now, and I have affiliate links down below where you can go and pick them up if you're interested. And while you're down there, feel free to check out my kit.com. I have links down there where you can see all of my other lighting kits and the lights that I use and recommend. And of course, Feel free to give this video a like while you're down there, click subscribe, and get that notification bell on. I've got a lot more content coming in 2021, and you're not going to want to miss any of it. I'll see you guys in the next one.